What does it take to master a skill? That is the question at the root of Adam Gopnik's new book. Adam, of course, is an award-winning writer and lecturer who has been a member of the New Yorker staff for nearly 40 years and a published author many times over. His new book is called The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery. Adam, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Trey. Pleasure to talk to you. Austin, as I, uh, as you know, is a place I like because my son is there. <laughs> it's a pretty good reason to like a place. So what was your goal with the real work? Um, the book happened, um, I don't want to say accidentally, but organically. I uh, found myself uh, first studying magic with my son, Luke, who became, as many 13-year-old boys do, became obsessed with card magic. And uh, I followed him to Las Vegas. And if you haven't followed your 13-year-old to Las Vegas, you haven't lived. Uh, <laughs> and I would spend time at, at 3 a.m. Um, uh, gatherings of magicians after they finished their work for the for the night. And I've heard, always heard them use this expression, the real work. They kind of mumble to each other. Uh, you know, the philosopher's illusion. That's not a real thing. I'm just making that up. Philosopher's illusion. Who's got the real work on that? Or the, the Varno shuffle. Who's got the real work on that? And I was fascinated by it. And it was shorthand, it turned out, um, for not for who invented a trick and not even for who did it most proficiently, but who was it who had first combined absolute technical virtuosity with a kind of empathetic engagement with the audience who had been able to do it, not just with their fingers, but with their minds. And that was what they were looking for, that kind of mastery. And it, it zinged me, it turned me on instantly because I recognized that that was exactly the thing that always turns me on in art. And I had spent 40 years as an art critic. And almost accidentally, right around the same time, I started taking life drawing lessons um, as a partly compensatory action after 40 years of work as an art critic, among many other things, who couldn't draw. I wanted, I wanted to try it. And kind of the collision of those two experiences, being in the presence of magicians who had this insane technical proficiency, but were in a sense... Um, uh, putting down, deprecating technical proficiency in favor of this kind of broader human empathetic engagement and struggling, struggling to learn drawing myself, that the the outlines of the book began to appear to me. And as I said, it wasn't that I set out to learn all these things. These things set out to learn me. I had to learn to drive uh, at a very advanced age in my 50s. And my son, Luke, and I actually, I think, are the only two, the only one father-son pair who got their driving licenses in New York City on the same day. Not just the same day, but from the same driving uh, judge. So all of these things kind of happened to me. And I took a boxing and dancing with my daughter, Olivia, and so on. And I realized as I did, as I said, that the outlines of the book were taking form because what was fascinating was all of these activities, different though they are, were susceptible to more or less the same shape the same set of rules. And I wanted to try and, and crystallize and humanize those rules. Yeah, I really enjoyed the personalization of this story because it's important regardless of what age we are. And obviously young people are, are maybe naturally better at this than we are when we get older. I'm in my mid forties now. Uh, you're a few years older than that. Well, we get, yeah, just few, I'm, I'm in my mid forties too. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, we get set in our comfort zones and we don't challenge ourselves like that anymore. And that's bad for us. Just as good as it is for us to, to try new things and to put ourselves through different uh, difficult processes. Uh, it, it can be really bad for your mind, body, and spirit to not engage in any of that sort of thing too. Bad for your mind, body, the spirit, soul, and even for your 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 professional life, right? Because you get tend to get shut off. One of the things we do, I talk about this in the chapter on draw, learning to draw in the book, is that we it's not so much that we only we do the things we like most, but we don't do the things that we weren't good at in the first place. So if you didn't yeah. have a, as I didn't, you didn't have natural coordination for drawing. Uh, you just put it up, you put it aside. Say that's not something I'm ever going to touch. And as we get older, we eliminate the things that challenge us and stick to the things that we feel comfortable with. And the good news is, I discovered pursuing all these things, learning to draw, is not that you'll ever get necessarily good at it. I will never be a great draftsman, and I will never be. You wouldn't want to put me in a boxing ring, though. I've been studying boxing for two years, unless you could find another five foot five. 
Jewish intellectual with uh, <laughs> uh, with flat feet who'd been doing a sedentary occupation for 40 years. You find that guy and, and I'm in there. I'm I'm in the ring. But it's not about getting good at something necessarily in that kind of external way. The satisfaction, which is profound, comes from this kind of magic moment, which you will find in any activity you pursue, when your struggle to learn all of those small, um, discouraging, counterintuitive, stumbling little steps that construct this activity, suddenly through sheer perseverance, turn into the flow, turn into the that magical moment of absorption when you're no longer thinking about it, when it suddenly is just happening. And as I, as I say, not in the book actually, but I've been saying it on the road, that's like a cognitive opiate. You know, we have all those opiates we inject in our veins, but this is one opiate we produce in our brains. This is, we produce it for ourselves. That sudden feeling of happiness, which is pure absorption in something outside of ourselves, everybody knows. And that's just as available to you if you're doing it badly, so long as you're doing it passionately and with perseverance, so long as you're really trying to master something as it is with the things that you're really good at. That's interesting. It's part epiphanous and part breakthrough as well. Now, the subtitle for this book is On the Mystery of Mastery. So for the sake of context, for everything else we're about to discuss, what is mastery? Well, I it's a mystery. <laughs> That's why I said that it was a mystery, because I wouldn't want to try and circumscribe it or define it too narrowly. But it's the real work. It's it's excellence in a vocation or in a in a skill or in an art form uh, that we're attempting. And we all one of the interesting things about it is we all recognize the real work uh, when we encounter it. Um, it's as I know in my own work. If you, as a reporter, ask anyone, a cook or a plumber or a painter, who's got the real work in your field? Nobody is ever silent or shrugs. They all say, "Oh yeah." Joe Catalano, he's the plumber who's got the real work. And if you've seen that guy plumbing, you know what the thing is all about. We all are conscious of people who are incredibly skilled, but also incredibly uh, empathetic, have a very rich sense of all the other minds that are spinning around them and aren't locked in their own, even as they show their own virtuosity. So that's what I think is of as the as the real work. And it's something that that um, is a mystery in as much as you can never reduce it to a formula. I say at the beginning of this book, this is a self-help book that won't help. And by that, I mean that there are no magic recipes for learning how to do things because the truth is the entirety of yourself has to get engaged when you're struggling to play the piano or the guitar or box. You can't um, segregate yourself off and there's no kind of pseudoscientific uh, recipe that's going to do it for you. The whole of your humanity is engaged and that's always going to be mysterious. But the good news is that if you if you engage the whole of your humanity, you will, I pretty much guarantee you, have a, 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 a use an old fashioned expression, kind of wondrous result. You will open up onto that flow in a way you might not have done since adolescence. So when you thinking about the mystery of mastery, you actually came up with seven different mysteries that you expand on for the most part. I know there is that uh, that one mystery at the end that we will certainly talk about at the end. But this starts with the mystery of performance. Why do you highlight a chess playing robot from the 18th and 19th century in this section? Well, because it seemed to me it was a fascinating instance of the mystery and the mystique, if you like of mastery. It's the so-called Turk, which was a chess playing robot or seemed to be a chess playing robot that toured Europe and America at the end of the 18th century. And this was a, a robotic figure, what they then called an automaton, dressed up in Ottoman garb, uh, which seemed to be a mechanical chess player. It seemed that it could take you on and then it would move in kind of robotic fashion on a chessboard uh, on the top of a cabinet. And um, it played and defeated every famous person of the period. It played and defeated Benjamin Franklin. It's said to have played and defeated uh, Napoleon and a whole range of chess masters. Now, like, to, to jump to the conclusion, of course, it wasn't a chess playing computer. That was hundreds of years uh, ahead. Um, what it was was just a, a magician's trick. There was a chess player secreted in the cabinet below the Turk, um, and the cabinet was skillfully made as magician's illusions 
uh, apparatus often are to look much smaller than it actually was. So there was room to fit a chess player inside it. But here's what, fa what fascinated me. People at the time, not being stupid, guessed, including Edgar Allan Poe, by the way, who wrote a whole uh, early, one of his earliest pieces of published writing, was trying to deduce how the Turk worked. And he said, it, it might be that there's a chess player inside that little cabinet, but it must be, people would, would say, it must be like this incredibly gifted and obscure midget chess player. It must be a child who yeah. the um, inventor has addicted to drugs or something. How else could this work? The truth was that von Kemplin, the, the magician who had invented it, simply went to a chess cafe or a chess club in every city he went to, in Paris or Baltimore, and said, in effect, who here needs a gig and doesn't mind close working conditions? And he would always find a very strong chess player who wanted 100 bucks or the equivalent then, who would get inside the smoky innards of the Turk and, and work it and play chess. So he, his genius was not to build a chess playing computer, which, as I say, was many centuries ahead. It was to recognize that in modern civilization, mastery is a ubiquitous. Mastery is extremely widespread. You can always find a very good chess player if you go looking for him. We tend to divide it, Trey, in our own minds, that there are the great masters. That was the mistake Edgar Allan Poe was making. There are these great supreme transcendent masters, and then there's uh, nobody beneath them. The reality is there are great masters. And then right below that level, there are incredibly good, strong chess players. That was the first thing that fascinated me, that that's a truth about modernity generally. If you think about it, right, the the third violin in the Tulsa Symphony Orchestra is a stronger violin player than anyone you have ever met or will ever know, even if not quite as strong as the as Yitzhak Perlman, right? So mastery is very widespread, and von Kemplin had the genius of understanding that early on. The other thing that fascinated me is that a very strong, a very good chess player could suddenly become a great chess player if you put him or hers, women uh, did it sometimes too, uh, in the context, in the, um, in the frame of this amazing uh, uh, smoke-emitting, uh, seemingly uh, computerized, seemingly mechanical chess player. Um, we don't just judge uh, things, masters, by in a narrow categorical way. We see them through the, the entirety of the effect, the atmosphere. That's one of the advantages magicians always have in us, is that they know that we'll see the whole context, the atmosphere, even if we're not entirely aware of it. Uh, and that makes can make a good chess player so intimidating uh, that he or she becomes a great chess player and can defeat players that he might not have been able to defeat if he came out, so to speak, unclothed uh, and just uh, naked as himself. And so that's why I call that um, the mystery of performance, because you can't separate out mastery as a narrow set of technical skills from the much broader context of performance in which it takes place. You openly admit to being enamored with magicians and just mm -hmm. uh, their process of getting better individually and then collectively, too. Why is watching Jamie Ian Swiss perform the pass 13 times in around 13 seconds while you were attending a, magi a magician dinner in a sports bar restaurant on Ninth Avenue in New York City called the Joshua Tree, the closest you've been to the aura of real work in your estimation? Because to see Jamie is a wonderful guy and a great irascible teacher. One of the things that I think I hope happens in this book is you get to meet uh, a number of wonderfully irascible and demanding teachers. Um, and Jamie is one of them. You know, it's one of the truths about great teachers is in Greek mythology, the great teachers are all centaurs, right? They're they're the wild men. They're not the tame men. And I think that's generally true about a great teacher. It's not somebody who's um, mild and conciliatory. It's somebody who's demanding and irascible. And nobody is more demanding and irascible than Jamie Ian Swiss. But seeing somebody with that level of technique still struggling to get better, still struggling to sort out all the ways in which this might be done. In other words, not complacently showing you or demonstrating in a kind of tedious way or self-bored way what he can do, but working laboriously, uh, tirelessly to improve. That, for me, is one of the one of the touching and moving signs of of the real work when you see it. And it's something I think we all recognize in, in everything we know. Michael Jordan was the hardest working basketball player who ever lived, along with being 
um, the most gifted one, Jerry Rice, would run up and down the steps of the stadium after everyone else had gone home. That uh, readiness for perseverance is is a is a crucial cognitive trait, if you like. And that's why it stirred me so much. Magic fascinates me in a broader sense because we think of it as a very minor art tray. It's not something that's at the forefront of our attention the way classical music might be or rock guitar might be. Um, we tend to condescend to it very often or patronize it. And yet magicians both have to have an unbelievably proficient and advanced uh, a technique. I mean, what they can do with their fingers is has to be astonishing. What they can do with their minds have to be astonishing. They they memorize what's called a stack, which is the precise order of 52 cards. And I used to see my son Luke lying in bed at night memorizing a stack, saying four of clubs, five of spades, queen of hearts, right? Just remembering how all 52 cards go. So they do these amazing things with their fingers and their brains, but they have to make it all invisible. As Jamie and Swiss has a great aphorism about that. He says, in other art forms, a technique can be transparent. Only in magic does it have to be invisible. You can't see what they're doing. So they have this incredible well of virtuosity, which they can only talk about with other magicians. So if, as a civilian, you have a chance to overhear these conversations with Jamie or with Teller of Penn and Teller, who, uh, ironically, is the silent one in the act, but the most voluble, the most articulate magician I've ever met, uh, you, you feel blessed when you have the opportunity to hear these guys. Speaking of Swiss's acumen as a teacher, it was while at Joshua Tree that you heard him describe to another magician why a seemingly good trick didn't work. Within his explanation, he said, quote, the method is not the trick. Why did this resonate with you? Well, it's exactly what I was trying to say at the beginning about what the secret of the real work is, right? He was trying to instruct impatiently, irascibly, a younger magician. And why, even though he had gotten this, the technique of the trick, right? He tore up a bill and then um, and then made it, you know, come all together, right? You tear up the bill, you put it in your hand and then it reattaches. It's a trick you've seen, I'm sure, a hundred times, right? Um, but Jamie's point was, that's, that's not the trick. That's the underlying, that's like the bare bones, the skeleton of it. But then you have to ask yourself the question. He said to this magician, why are you tearing up a bill? Give me a reason why you're tearing up the bill. Then what am I supposed to make of this? The fact that you put it back together again, right? Everything should be dramatically motivated in an effective magic trick. It's not enough just to do the stunt. You know, that's the way six-year-olds do a magic trick. They get it from the box and then they show it to you. It has to be part of a dramatic story. And the dramatic story has to speak in some way to a, a human need, to a, a broader human story. It has to engage us in some empathetic way. And that's what Jamie was trying to teach this kid impatiently, as I say. And um, that's an incredibly valuable lesson, I think, for us all to take in. It's equally true of drawing, you know, which seems like on totally on the other end of human activity. One of the things that great draftsmen learn is to invite what we might call the beholder's share. In other words, you're making marks that deliberately have a penumbra of, of, of um, vagueness. Think of impressionist painting, right? There's a wonderful example of this. Have a, have a penumbra of atmospherics. They invite us in to complete the form. Chinese brush painting is of the same kind. They understand the great draftsman, what I call in the book, the eloquence of the eraser, the way that smudging or interrupting a line invites us, our eyes to finish it and replenish its form with our own imaginations. We, we've all seen that. We prefer to look at a, at a quick suggestive sketch rather than a hyper-finished uh, photographic painting very often. So that deliberate introduction of, of a kind of imperfection is equally important in magic and in classical drawing because they both engage our minds rather than simply instructing our eyes. You spent some time around the polarizing David Blaine, who your son, Luke, actually uh, worked for at a younger age. Yes. What did you learn about mastery from Blaine? Well, I, it was fascinating to me because in the in the um, story about magic, which uh, occurs in the book, uh, I sort of juxtapose uh, Jamie Swiss and David Blaine, uh, who, interestingly, though it isn't spelled out in the in the in the story, I let the readers beholders share fill in. Uh, this truth. It's my my son, Luke, was sort of torn between them. Jamie was his teacher, but David was recruiting him as a 
as a personal assistant. He eventually went to work for him. And they represented very different approaches to magic. Jamie, a classical approach, very much like my drawing teacher, Jacob Collins. Classical approach, firmly re rooted in tradition and technique. And David, very modern, if you like postmodern, 21st century approach, which is constantly trying to smudge the line, break the line between a uh, magic and performance. So in David's idea, though David's a very proficient magician himself, but he loves things that are as much like performance art as they are like magic tricks. In fact, he has contempt for magic tricks. And there's a moment when he's when uh, he says that to Jamie and Jamie is properly offended. These aren't what I do. He says aren't magic tricks. They're part of a great tradition. But um, what David does, as you know, is to try things like not sleeping for six days or locking yourself in a in a block of ice or one of the things he did which which provoked an alternative title for this book actually was the bullet catch you know the bullet catch is a classic of stage magic which in the first part of the 20th century was done live was really done where the uh, magician's assistant fires a bullet from a rifle at the magician who catches the bullet in a steel cup that he holds uh, between his jaws, in his mouth. Um, and in the first part of the 20th century, a lot of magicians were killed doing the bullet catch because it's incredibly dangerous. Um, and so since then, magicians still do it, but they do it as a gaffed effect. It's not a real bullet being fired into the mouth. David, because his aesthetic is to erase the line between uh, magic and, and performance art, wanted to do it the real way, wanted to do it with a real gun, a real bullet and a real cup in his mouth. So Luke, my son, was working for him at that point as his, as his personal assistant. And I said to Luke, um, tell me, uh, what's the trick with it? Well, you know, how's David doing? And he said, well, remember, Dad, it's a very uh, low velocity rifle, small caliber bullet. It's all laser guided. Um, it's a very strong titanium cup in his mouth. And I said, oh, you mean there's no trick to the bullet catch? And Luke said, oh, yeah, Dad, there is a trick to the bullet catch. I said, <laughs> like I do, well, what is it? And he said, Dad, the trick to the bullet catch is catching the bullet. <laughs> and of course, I knew instantly what he meant. It was like a Zen Cohen, right? That in everything we do, the trick to the bullet catch is always catching the bullet. And everything we attempt to do, there's a moment of kind of maximum existential risk, moment of when you actually have to step forward with the cup in your mouth and catch the bullet. I've never done that precisely, but of course, I've done a lot of performing in my life. And every performer knows that the moment when the lights go down and you step forward, you're catching the bullet. Um, even writing, which seems like a much more cerebral, detached art form, when, you, when it's, you're fighting to deadline and you've got to get the sentences right and the sentences are producing themselves, you're catching the bullet. Uh, everyone who's ever practiced, not just an art form, but a sport, or like boxing or football, or any kind of uh, engaging human activity knows that the trick to the bullet catch is catching the bullet. And I almost call this book Catching the Bullet in tribute to that uh, to that aphorism, to that bit of encoded wisdom, uh, but decided it might sound as though it were a book about gun control. So I, <laughs> I thought better of it, but kept the story as one of the mysteries of mastery in the book. Yeah, that's probably a good decision, but I do like that book title. Uh to be fair also so catching the bullet yeah I, I did too we debated it in the i debated it with my editor but as i say we thought it was likely to be misunderstood and i'd have to spend too much time in a conversation like this one explaining the title uh the real work is uh is easy to explain and in a sense more evocative of the actual contents of the of the stories no doubt about that the next mystery is the mystery of identity and intention who was S.W. Erdnays? I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that last name. And what does he or she have to do with identity and intention? Well, you can't mispronounce the name because nobody knows who he was and nobody knows how you should pronounce the name. It's a <laughs> made up name, S.W. Erdnays, that uh, uh, was used uh, as a pseudonym by the author of the most famous book on card magic from the beginning of the 20th century, the most influential book called The Expert at the Card Table. And it's kind of the, the the Bible, the foundation, the Old Testament, if you like, of all modern card magic, in large part because it was read and taken up by a Canadian kid, I'm Canadian in origin, named Di Vernon, uh, before the First World War. He made it his Bible and then became the greatest uh, and by far the most influential 
sleight of hand man of the 20th century, ended his life at the um, the Magic Castle in Los Angeles, sessioning, and sessioning being like the the magic equivalent of a of a jazz session of a of a jam of a jam session. And the great question is, there is no such person as S. W. Erdnes. Doesn't appear anywhere. And people early on realized it must be a pseudonym, probably for somebody named Andrews, because that would be the name spelled backwards. So there's been this long search for Erdnes, for this um, somebody named Andrews, who would have been capable of writing this remarkable encyclopedia of card magic. And the question of who that person might be and what his intentions were in writing this book affects your reaction it affects your reception of it, your understanding of what was intended. And there's been a, a, a terrifically interesting book by a great contemporary sleight of hand, man named Steve, uh, and now I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Steve Forte, hmm. uh, uh, saying that in his view, and this guy is the the, the master card manipulator of, of our time, not a magician, by the way, but a, a, a professional card manipulator in casinos and so on. Um, and he says, this guy, the guy, Erdnays, whoever he was, can't have been uh, a real professional card sharp because he makes the point that real professional card sharps don't have this great encyclopedic mastery over a thousand tricks. Only magicians do that. Real card cheaters um, know two or three basic moves, which they do on people in dim light when they're drunk. In other words, they're much too brutally efficient to fool around with all kinds of complicated um, finger magic. So he makes this very strong case that uh, Erdnays presenting himself as a card cheat is actually cheating. He's actually not a card cheat. He was a magician pretending to be a card cheat. And that affects your understanding, which intention you think it is, affects your understanding of the, the work. And that's always true in all performance. Your know, performance mastery is a two-way street. It's always a two-way street. It's made up of our expectations and the masters and the the performer's performance. It's why art historians, and I trained as an art historian, I'm 37 years late with my PhD thesis. My son is getting his in right now, but I am still late with mine. I trained as an art historian, and it's why art historians are so obsessed with or concerned about questions of forgery. You say, well, if it's a beautiful drawing, who cares if it was drawn by Rodin in 1890, or it was drawn by Joe Schmo two years ago? It's the same drawing. Yes, it is. But our understanding of its of its not just its value, but of its meaning depends on whether we understand it as part of the history of Rodin or if we understand it as part of the history of of Joe Schmo. Um, and that's true even about, as I explained in the book, you know, there are Persian poets, supposedly medieval, who have been translated into modern American English in ways that experts in Persian tell us misrepresent their real their real turn of mind that these they're actually deeply religious and we make them secular in effect. Well, we love those poets, um, uh, Hafiz and Rumi, but we're in a sense, we love them more if we think we're in dialogue with them across centuries and cultures than if in fact, we're simply talking to ourselves, so to speak, talking to somebody else who's within our own culture. So that's why the Erdnays mystery, I think speaks for all of these broader mysteries of intention and therefore, ex exactly the point I'm making is, is that understanding an intention is crucial to uh, our enjoyment, our appreciation of any art form or any, uh, uh, if we think a, it's true about a sport too, if we think a game has been rigged, we have a totally different reaction to it than if we think that it's an, a genuine uh, uh, achievement in sports. So the, the point, uh, mastery of every kind whether it's card cheating or violin playing or um, dancing, uh, is it always a two-way street? There's information transmitted and information received, and what we think about the transmitter will affect the way we receive it. I love that you attempted to master driving enough that you get your driver's license, which, spoiler alert, you ultimately do. Now, some people listening here in Texas might scratch their heads at that, but when you've lived your entire life in New York City, you don't need to know how to drive a car because the public transportation system is so good there. You can obviously hop in a, ca hop in a cab if need be. Obviously, there's Uber and Lyft now to boot. Um, but um, what was the most difficult aspect of learning how to drive? Because unlike trying to draw a, uh, a real life subject or learning sleight of hand magic tricks or boxing or dancing, 
it is a much simpler process, correct? Yes. And what I discovered, you know, I had to, is exactly as you say, I lived most of my adult life, all of my adult life in New York, except for a brief period when I was the New Yorker's correspondent in Paris, which is a city with even fewer private cars uh, than New York. So I had missed that chance to do it. And Luke, again, was needed to learn to drive. He was going to college out of, out of town. So he, at the age of 20, me at the age of 56, he took driving lessons together. So what I discovered is that driving isn't really difficult. It's just insanely dangerous. Yeah. And for the most part, if you learn to drive, as I suspect you did, Trey, when you're 16 or 17, when you're 16 or 17, you take it for granted that you're immortal and can come to no harm. That's you know part of the tragedy of uh, of teenagers and drunk driving and so on. Um, and so we teach our we teach teenagers how to drive, and they uh, incorporate into their muscle systems and their muscle memory the truths of driving, and they don't really um, absorb just how insanely dangerous driving a car is. Um, you know, you've got four tons of steel at your command. You're going at 50, 60 miles an hour or more, and there is nothing to prevent you from steering it directly into traffic, into pedestrians, or anything else. It's a crazily dangerous activity. Um, and we seal ourselves off from just how dangerous it is if we learn it young enough so we're not we're not fully conscious of that. But if you learn it in your 50s, that's all you're experiencing is, is oh my God, this guy in a 16-wheeler is bearing down on me. How am I going to manage? I did my first driving up Madison Avenue, a big street in New York, surrounded by furious Middle Eastern cabbies and by uh, honking uh, truck drivers and by my wonderful, talked about the brilliant teachers I had, wonderful driving instructor named Arturo Leon, who was a genius of of driving instruction. And so uh, I'd realized that interesting thing, actually, Trey, as I've gone around the country talking about the book, and people tend to enjoy that chapter because talk about the comedy of inadequacy, it it, it exemplifies that. Um, many people have said to me that they stopped driving to, during the pandemic for a year and a half or even two years. And then when they started up driving again, they were aware for the first time in their lives of just how dangerous driving is. They had been effectively inured from it by familiarity and repetition. And when they got back in a car, they suddenly had my reaction, which is, how can anyone do this thing? It is so risky. It is so potentially lethal. Yeah, I mean, to your point, learning how to drive anywhere is potentially dangerous, but doing so in New York City is like trying to learn how to swim by being thrown into the deep end. It's thrown I mean, into the deep end in a pool full of sharks and alligators. I yeah. might, I yeah, might. Having said all of that, how did uh, learning how to drive in that city change your perception in the city that you love so much? Um, it, it did it in a couple of ways. One thing is, is that with all of the potentially lethal danger, which I'm not to, you know, joke unduly, is actual real danger as well. A problem of traffic, fatalities, drunk driving on it are profound. But a, one way in which it changed it is, is you become aware, despite how dangerous driving really is, people manage it on the whole. You know, we have some law enforcement. We don't have a lot of law enforcement on the streets of New York City. Uh and yet people, if, if you think about it, we stop at red lights, we go on green lights, we wait for pedestrians for the most part to cross before we turn left uh, and, and into them. Uh, driving in a city like New York is in a way a mind boggling demonstration of the self-organizing power of cities. You know, the with all of the difficulties and dangers and crime and occasional lethality of cities on the whole, we managed simply through the consensus of the citizens to survive together, to, to coexist. And that's kind of an, a, an astonishing thing if you think about, about it. Looking at cars going you know, 40 miles per hour uh, by press people, you'd think that we would have anarchy and we don't. So that's one positive thing you can see about, uh, uh, about New York and about cities. Uh, and the other thing is, is that, and I say this as someone who came so late to it, there's something deeply seductive about the car. It, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, when you're driving in New York, you enter, use that same word again, into an empathetic relationship with your fellow citizens and the rest of America, because cars do give you autonomy. Cars do give you a sense of independence. That's not an illusion. I say this to somebody who doesn't own a car now, kind of came late to it. The the almost fetishized attraction of the car to America is completely apparent. Once you start driving, I love driving. I totally love driving, even though I came to it late 
And even though on some abstract level, I recognize that it creates all kinds of harms and difficulties for the city, the country, and the planet. That necessary cohesion is why I'm a big fan of the courtesy wave. Like it's important that we acknowledge to one another that we're all working together. When somebody leaves you enough room to turn from another street or maybe you're turning out of a driveway or let's say you're a pedestrian and that car does stop at the crossing walk. Yeah, that's what they're supposed to do. But there are plenty of examples of people who just blow right through that situation. For So, so someone to show that awareness just that little wave. I think it goes a long ways in making sure that they do so the next time too. Exactly, exactly. And Arturo Leon, my driving teacher, instantiated that in a rule called the hand. Always use the hand, you know, the courtesy wave, right? And he said the great thing on that, in other words, always try and connect with the drivers around you, just as you said, to show them you're a human being struggling to do the right thing. <laughs> you're not some kind of, you know, autonomous evil agent enclosed inside this, the machine, this this dark machine. So he said, Adam, always use the hand. Always use the hand. Use the hand to say thank you. Use the hand to say bless you. Use the hand to say F you. Just always use the <laughs> hand to stay in contact with the other drivers. And, and that's exactly right. Because one of the risks of driving is, is that we, it's the reason for road rage, right? We get so enclosed in our own little metal box that we forget that everybody else on the road is exactly, has a mind, and, and a desire like ours to get home safely for the most part. So the hand, the courtesy wave is essential to driving. Next up is the mystery of interiority. What is interiority and why is it an important facet of mastery? Well, this is in a sense, the most kind of, if I may say, kind of the most mystical or you yeah. know, metaphysical uh, section passage in the book it was very important to me. It starts with the, um, uh, with an old kind of what you would think might be an old uh, folk tale, which is that hummingbirds and elephants are said to have exactly the same number of heartbeats in a lifetime, a billion heartbeats. Um, that's that's why Trump said he never exercised. He said we all yes, we didn't, want to use up, didn't want to use up his heartbeats. A hummingbird uses up its heartbeats in 100 days, so to speak, and the elephant in 100 years, but they have the same number of heartbeats. It's a beautiful poem about by the poet Mary Oliver saying, the crucial choice in life is how will you expend your own vital and irreplaceable uh, heartbeats? Mm -hmm. And bizarrely, you'd think that would be totally an apocryphal story. It turns out to be more or less true. There's a, a research project at North Carolina State University called the Heartbeat Project, where they count heartbeats of mammals and birds and grosso motor, roughly speaking, that's true. Though, as Trump should know, human beings are almost the only exception because we can add heartbeats to our life because we work out, we take care of ourselves. We're self-conscious creatures who want to live longer and so on. Put that to one side. But what, <laughs> what fascinated me was the idea, which we can't prove, but feels intuitively feels correct, that hummingbirds don't experience life more briefly than elephants do that a hummingbird's experience of life is as existentially rich, as full as the elephants. Hummingbirds are, are not fully conscious to begin with, but are not conscious in that way, at least. But they're not going around saying, I wish I could live as long as an elephant. Their hearts are beating. They're doing the things that hummingbirds do. They're sipping nectar, uh, fertilizing eggs. They're living uh, their billion heartbeats. They're living their billion heartbeats. And in the same way, I think human beings can choose to focus on their inner hummingbird, if you like, on our interiority. And in a very straightforward way, one of the things that that means is that the satisfaction we may take from a mastery undertaken ineptly or later in life may really be just as satisfying in the, if you like, the interior hummingbird world of our own consciousness as a, a, the kind of super mastery that we might be able to show off in the external uh, elephant world of achievement and reward. That's a poetic way of saying the simple truth that I take as much pleasure in boxing badly week after week after week as I suspect anyone has ever taken a pleasure in boxing well year after year after year um, simply by engaging with all our heart and soul in the activity, doing that business of taking the small, broken, stumbling steps that we learn at the beginning when we break down an activity into its small parts, taking and boxing, you know, you take the endlessly repeated sequence of jab, jab, cross, um, slip, uppercut, and you learn it. And at a certain moment, it becomes second nature to you. That beautiful expression comes second nature to you. It becomes invisible 
uh, like the magician's technique to your conscious mind, but something that exists inside you, like the hummingbird's heartbeats. And at that moment, the, the high that you get, the cognitive opiate that you produce for yourself is uh, utterly transcendental. It's something that just lifts your heart and gives meaning to your life. And it doesn't matter if you're actually good at it or not in that sense, if you're committed to it. If you're committed to it, then the inner hummingbird is as happy as the outer elephant. And that's what I mean by the mystery of interiority. Next up is the mystery of meaning. And you turn to music to help yourself and also the reader better understand the mystery of meaning, the fourth mystery of mastery. You write that the truth of music resonates with the central truth of magic. That is, we need evident imperfection to be perfectly impressed. What do you mean by this and why, Adam? I, I try and demonstrate it at some length. Music I, is my passion in life. I'm a, a, in addition to being an essayist, I'm a lyricist. I write words for songs and for shows. Um, uh, and one of the things that fascinates me so much about music is, is that you know music is just a series of vibrations in the air, which you can analyze mathematically. And yet it's the most powerful emotional instrument in every sense, the most powerful tool emotionally that we have. We all make our lives, we map our lives on music. You think about your first love, your second love, your brokenhearted love, your hopes, your fears, and they're all tied to, they're all set to music. They're all literally set to music. So I was fascinated with the question of how does music uh, have this enormous reservoir of meaning. Uh, and I got interested in the story of someone who was uh, a, a musical engineer who was on the spectrum, what we used to call autistic, though we've now learned that that's an inadequate term for it, uh, who was brilliant at engineering the, the mathematics of music, but had no feeling for the emotions of music at all. Uh, didn't understand why people were moved by music. And then he got um, uh, MRI resonance uh, treatment. And suddenly, as he said, he stopped in the middle of a highway because he was listening to music that he knew and he was overwhelmed by the emotion of the music for the first time in his life. And I wanted to understand how that could happen. And what seems to be true about what makes music so meaningful is that it depends exactly as you said, not on the, the dialogue once again, between um, the beauty of perfection, of performance and composition with a, a deliberate, addition of willed imperfection. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, there are some uh, students of the psychology of music at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, Dan Levitin uh, is the most famous one. And they've produced a programmable keyboard, a programmable piano that you can feed a certain amount of randomness into. So the piano can be mechanically playing Chopin and you can make it play it exactly on the beat, exactly to the note values, exactly as it's written. And people will find that version tedious, right? The, the mechanically perfect version will find tedious. You can introduce a lot of randomness into the performance and they'll find that chaotic. There's a kind of human sweet spot between those two things where there's enough technical proficiency for us to uh, admire it. And there's all of those little human qualities that great musicians put in, legato, you know, uh, slowing down the beat, speeding up the beat, italicizing certain passages, playing, with uh, with volume, with dynamics, something's very loud, something's softer, all those things that great pianists do instinctively and through their education. And that's where music has meaning for us, exactly in the meeting of perfection and deliberate imperfection. But think about a great singer, right? What do we love about a great singer? We love her vibrato. We love her human sound. If we could reproduce exactly the same sequence of notes sung exactly the same way by a computer, but that's not why we love Beyonce or Judy Garland or uh, any other great singer. We love their individuality. Um, so that for me is the mystery of meaning. How is it that we take all of our humanity, we channel it into a particular art form or even into a particular song, and we produce something that touches all hearts? Yeah, music is uh, such a beautiful mystery for so many different reasons. I spoke with Susan Rogers a few months back. She is a former music producer and engineer who worked with Prince during some of his most productive years in the mid-1980s. She actually went back to school 
to become a neuroscientist who specifically wow. studies yeah. music's effect on the brain. I highly recommend this book. It's a beautiful book. But one of the things she points out is the relativity with which a piece of music impacts the listener. That includes how someone is able to hear the music itself, like what they're literally thinking when they're listening to a song. It could be envisioning the story being told in those lyrics. It could be just putting you into some general happy place because of the overall tone of the instrumentation. Or it could have a time travel effect where it's literally taking you back to a different point in time where that song is indicative of some really positive or maybe even a negative moment in your past life. Sure. And we all learn um, when we get intrigued by a new form of music. It takes us a while to learn what the expressive range of it is. You know, I got during the pandemic, like everyone, I, we were watching movies that we had never watched before. And we watched the great trilogy, the Apu trilogy by Sajat Ray, great Indian film director. And that was where Ravi Shankar, the great sitar player, became famous because he did the music that accompanied that uh, those movies. And when you're watching the movies and hearing Shankar's music at the same time, you make a much stronger, more sympathetic connection between all of the expressive tropes, all of the expressive meaning in that music, because you're seeing it matched to the to the particular emotion, the village sadness, love between a, a, a mother and son and so on, so on. So you educate yourself in the expressive range of the music by broadening your understanding of its of its deliberate uses so it doesn't just sound like indian music it sounds far more particular and expressive we do the same thing when we learn about we learn by listening we don't have to we don't it's not something we learn by inculcation somebody tells us our minds expand as our experience of the music expands very, uh, very well said there what is the mystery of late style i understand that of course after uh, reading through this book but this may be the most underrated of these different mysteries that you talk about yeah, uh, it it particularly set off for me, to be honest with you, Trey, because uh, my mother is one of the subjects of the book. And one of the themes of the book is that we can't undertake any uh, mastery or attempt it uh, without being immediately connected to all the other people in our life. I was learning to drive. It was really about my relationship with my father, who was a great driver from the age of 14 on. And I was learning to bake with my mother, who's a scientist and a linguist, but also a fantastic baker. We were having a conversation in dough that we would have had difficulty having in tongue. Um, but my mother is, you know, 88 years old now and not the baker she once was, no more than I will be when I'm 88. And I got to thinking about, you know, late style, what it is that happens particularly to great artists, but to all of us as we age. And one of the things that happens is, is that the things we care about most passionately and the style that we've mastered through life um, tend to get to be a kind of distilled down to their elemental parts. And I use the example of the great painters, Matisse, Henri Matisse, right? One of the, maybe the greatest painter of the 20th century had arthritis in his hands uh, as he got older and he couldn't paint anymore, literally couldn't hold a paintbrush, but he didn't give up painting. Instead, he turned to scissors and he would cut out pieces of colored paper that he would uh, have uh, painted to his own specifications, his own color. He would cut out pieces of colored paper and use those in the element of these great cutouts. And what you ended up with was not a lesser Matisse, but a kind of refined distillation, like a liqueur of everything Matisse had always been about. And they're enormously moving. And the same thing is true about the great Renaissance painter Titian, who lived an incredibly long life. By the end of his life, he was just barely kind of feathering the paint onto the surface of the picture, but he made these great kind of proto-impressionist mythological pictures in that way. And I think again and again, same thing is true about the late Mozart, though Mozart is a kind of hummingbird phenomenon because he was only in his 30s when his when his when he stopped writing music when he died. And yet his hummingbird heart had beaten so rapidly that his late music, is his last music is like late music, very pure melodic distillation of everything we love in Mozart. So that's true not just about the great masters it's true about all of us i think as we grow older though we may be disabled in some ways there's a part of us that gets um that can get kind of become a kind of uh, uh full color x-ray of our original souls and psyches and we have to pray that that will happen i don't mean to diminish for a second trey the tragedy of parkinson's and the unimaginable tragedy of um, alzheimer's and of dementia if you've experienced them worst things I think the cruelest things in life. But there's always the possibility that as we age, we aren't diminished. We are 
refined. You make a bold admission in this book, Adam. That is that you suffer from shy bladder syndrome. And I will show my appreciation to this admission by telling you in public for the first time or as public as this podcast is that I also suffer from shy bladder syndrome. That is not feeling comfortable going number one in public places around other people. The uh, urination troughs at Wrigley Field is one of the most disgusting places I've been in my life. I don't know how you're supposed to do that in general, much less when uh, other people's elbows are touching you. But uh, that is a reality, and it's not somebody that affects everyone. So how did cognitive behavioral therapy administered by the perfectly named therapist Dan Rocker help you master your own urinary domain uh, in this regard? Well, first of all, bravo, Trey, for, for uh, confessing it. One of the fascinating things I found... Dan Rocker is this wonderful, uh, an original therapist and a crazy bicyclist as well, uh, told me, you know, you feel that your your trouble, your phobia is shameful, but nobody else thinks it's shameful. They'll all just be glad that you're being honest about something that's a vulnerability because everybody's got one. That's Dan's uh, uh, maxim, his motto, you know, is that everybody's struggling with something and we just don't know what the next guy is struggling with or the next woman. So I have an extremely uh, kind of uh, uh, acute form of shy bladder syndrome, which is actually called medically periuresis. If you can imagine, there's actually an international periuresis association, of which Dan Rocker is currently the president, and it's a real problem. You know, we can we can uh, we can make light of it or snigger at it, but if you suffer from it, and you don't suffer from it as far as anyone can tell, because you had a traumatic experience and you were a kid or something, it's one of those things like so many phobias that you construct for yourself. You didn't want to use a public bathroom when you were eight or nine, and you found ways of avoiding it. You didn't drink water with your family. Whatever it was, you constructed this um, anxiety disorder. You constructed this phobia, and then you wake up in your 50s, or even in my case, in your 60s, and discover that you are imprisoned by this. And silly and foolish as it sounds, uh, if you suffer from shy bladder, extreme shy bladder syndrome or periuresis, very hard to go on a long plane ride, right? Because you just, you can't use the plane washroom. It's really um, disabling in that way. So I wanted to get past it. And I studied with Dan Rocker. And two things were were significant for me about it. First, it was that the rest of the book I'm writing about mastery, how we build up mastery out of all those little blocks. And here I'm writing about another kind of mastery where we master our fears. We master our phobias by disassembling uh, all the little blocks that we had built up by ourselves unconsciously over time and which now surround us and imprison us. And that's just what a phobia is like. So disassembling those little steps exactly mirrors kind of like a kind of black mass version of mastery, exactly mirrors the process by which we master things. To be specific, the way you treat periuresis is, the, you know, you basically you say, I can't go to Wrigley Field to the, the mass sluice thing. I'm never going to do that. Well, what could you do? Could you feel okay in a kind of in a locked stall someplace else in the press box? Yeah, you say, yeah, I could probably do that. So let's start there. We'll start there. Okay, what if you left, you do that? Let's leave the stall door open, but you'll still be by yourself, right? Not having to touch hands, anything else. Could you do that? Okay, I'll try that, right? And over time, and it takes a good deal of time, perseverance is the rule here as well. You find, okay, I can manage that. All right, let's go up one step beyond that. Could you go... In a, in a private urinal, not one where you're rubbing elbows. And through that kind of exposure, amazingly, but just in the same way that through perseverance, all of those little awkward stumbling steps in dancing become something recognizably like the foxtrot, exactly the same way. If you pursue uh, though that ladder of graduated exposure, you actually get better. And I am here to tell you that you can you can really... You can't cure it. You know, it's one of those things that will never go away entirely. Dan Rocker, my wonderful therapist, um, has suffered from periuresis. That's why he treats it his whole life. And he's in good shape. But as he says, he says, I lock up about 20% of the time. I can't do it. That's the way it is with all phobias. When we're just 10% better with the phobia, it's so releasing. It's so liberating. And the most important thing about overcoming a phobia is exactly that you learn the difference Again, this is Dan's language, but it's beautiful language between difficulty and danger. It may be difficult for you and me to urinate in a public place, but it's not really dangerous for us. For us, we add the danger to it from our own 
panicked responses. And learning throughout life, the, diff the difference between difficulty and danger is, I think, incredibly valuable. All right. Congrats on making learning how to be more comfortable urinating around others sound so poetic. And uh, while I do agree with everything you just said, I am still lobbying hard for every public bathroom in this country, the urinals uh, included, or the urinals especially, to have a divider in between them. I mean, that is the least that we can ask of uh, of these public bathrooms. I will, I will not oversell my own accomplishment in this thing. I, can't, I still can't handle a, a mass shared uh, public urinal, so I'm totally with you on that. Yeah, just avoid. I know they've done some uh, some renovations over the years, but just avoid Wrigley Field at all costs. All right, last question now. I don't mean to skip over the mystery of the act itself and then also resolve, but people are just going to have to check this book out to find more about those. I wanted to get back to drawing for this final question because you were somebody who was not artistically inclined like that until you made an effort to get better at it, despite the fact that your career is in large part uh, to serve as an art critic. So how did getting better at drawing change your perception as an art critic? Well, you know, going back to Wrigley Field, uh, you know, you don't have to be able to hit a hundred mile per hour fastball to be a great sports writer. And you don't have to be able to draw to be a, a, a art critic. You have to be able to respond to drawings and respond to things. But I, I also think, you know, if you've never swung a bat at a 50 mile per hour fastball and missed it, you're lacking a certain kind of empathetic understanding of what the real task confronting a major league hitter is. You'll always be sure to that understand. Just as if you, until you start boxing yourself, you don't really understand what you're watching when you watch really great boxers uh, fight. You know, you don't understand that when you watch the great Alexis Arguello uh, fighting, maybe the greatest technical fighter there's ever been, watch him on YouTube, and you realize his genius is how not how he throws the punch, but how he gets his guard back up instantly after having thrown, gets his left hand and right hand back up to protect his um, his head. That's his genius. And in the same way, I think that learning to draw very badly, I might I might add, but better than I could before, made me aware, if you like, of sort of the the micro dramatics. That's a, an ugly term, but I just mean the way that in everything you look at, it's very easy for us if you're trained in art history, you're trained in art criticism, to treat pictures and drawings as though they're kind of like pawns in a game of historical chess. First, there was realism, then there was impressionism, then there was post-impressionism, then there was cubism. But those are categories that art critics think up and artists stay out of. When you're forced to think about how was it that Leonardo made this gesture? What was the difference in his mind or in the mind of Georges Seurat when he was stippling with dots between the way the right foot rests fully on the ground and the way the left foot is drawn up and that changes the entire contour and articulation of the hip. Art is made up of those micro questions. Those are the questions that artists obsess over much more than they obsess over the kind of macro questions about history and meaning that obsess appropriately sometimes art historians and art critics. So having your attention drawn to the minute particulars is incredibly healthy. And that's what learning to draw does for you in writing about art. He is Adam Gopnik. The new book is The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery. You can get it now wherever books are sold. Adam, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for this book. Really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Great. I enjoyed it so much. Say hello to Austin for me. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for tuning in. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. We'll talk to you next time on Books on Pod.